Testament lesson for this evening is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, and it will be read responsively, as you will see in your bulletin. The time is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with Israel and Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although they broke my covenant, I was patient with them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will set my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will become their God and they shall become my people. No longer need they teach one another to know the Lord. All of the high and the low of life shall know me, says the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to kneel or to remain standing as we make confession to God. We take a moment in silence. So as we remember who we are and whose we are, we pray together. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and penitent sinner, confess to you all my sins and failures with which I have offended you and for which I justly deserve your punishment. But I am sorry for them and repent of them and pray for your boundless mercy. For the sake of the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinner, and forgive my sins. Give me your Holy Spirit for the amendment of my sinful life, and bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us. For his sake, he forgives us all of our sins. And through his Holy Spirit, he cleanses us and gives us power to proclaim the mighty deeds of him who called us out of darkness into the splendor of his light. And so now as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this wonderful sacrament, you have left us a memorial of Jesus' suffering and death. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the way we live will proclaim the redemption you paid with your own blood. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our epistle lesson is taken from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 to 26, the Lord's Supper. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part 
For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord. be our prayer. May I never fail to thank you day and night for your true body and true blood. O God, my peace and light. We're going to hear two from two of the gospel writers uh, this evening, one with the, the gospel lesson self, as you'll be hearing Matthew chapter 26, starting with the 17th verse, and also Luke's account in the 22nd chapter of his gospel. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. <clears throat> Glory be to thee, O Lord. Now. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city 
to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the 12 and as they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. They were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? And he answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. Son of man goes and it's written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, <coughs> who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace be to you. you. May be seated. As we turn again to the events of this particular night, the night that uh, Matthew has just spoken of in that 26th chapter. Just so that you get the, uh, the connection, so to speak, that they are both talking about events. Obviously, Matthew was there. Luke was not. Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples. Luke, a physician who has spent much of the time after he became a believer with Paul and uh, the others that were out there to carry this news of a savior, of a Messiah who gave his life. So. Listen to how, Matthew, how Luke picks up this same event. Remember, he is with these folks who were eyewitnesses as the Holy Spirit leads him then to, to give us a, you know, another perspective, uh, to sort of take the events that we hear about in Matthew and Mark and look at them from a slightly different vantage point. But he begins the same way. In verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Oh, some details added, right? That which was so important. So I pray God's grace and his peace. My Father, Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit who's brought us together this evening. That Passover lamb, the shedding of its blood. And I realize that blood is usually not a good sign, right? We learned this already probably when we're the same uh, uh, age as the littlest ones here. Yeah? Blood is yeah, usually a sign 
that we associate with some pain uh, and something that has gone wrong, think back. Think back to that first time that you skinned your knee as you splattered out there in your yard, at a playground, at a friend's house, and you learned that bloody knees are not a lot of fun by any means. Or maybe you remember hands and fingers getting cut and scratched as uh, you helped dad clean up some of those, those bigger tree limbs after a bad storm. Or, for many of us, there was that sheet of paper that attacked you as it moved in just the wrong way and left this little slice on your finger. The result was pain and blood. So yeah, blood is usually not a good sign. But sometimes it is. In fact, it's intriguing, is it not, that we have this expression in English about someone or something being the lifeblood, right, of that event, that activity, that group, right, Ms. English teacher? It doesn't have to do with somebody bleeding. That lifeblood of something that has happened. And in a sense, that's what we're looking at here from Luke's perspective. On that day, before Jesus was put on the cross and he gathered with his disciples to celebrate an event in which blood was clearly a very good sign for all of them and for us. They were about to eat with Jesus this meal known as Passover. You know that. We've celebrated Passover here. Uh, at Cross of Christ as it at least it can best be constructed from our perspective of what went on in the first century at the time of Jesus what was happening there that annual holiday when God's people gathered together to celebrate what God did for his people way back there in time in that location we know Today is Egypt. Remember the Israelites were in slavery to the Egyptians? Not just for a year or two or three, for 430 years. They had been parked out there, not in the Holy Land, in Egypt. <coughs> and God was going to do something about it. God was ready to act So he told him, through Moses, to take some bread, some bread with no yeast, as we'll have this evening, to show that God was going to act quickly to bring them out of slavery. And also a sacrificial lamb that would produce the blood that was to link God's promise with his rescue. As they put that blood of the lamb here and here and here and here around their homes. It was to mark those places that were filled with God's people, with those who believed that that rescue would take place. 
that blood that would be a sign to the angel of death. So that when he saw that sign of that blood, he would pass over that particular home. Sparing the firstborn sons of that group. And for more than a thousand years, God's people continued to celebrate this holiday every year by eating the same kind of bread and lamb and remembering the words of Moses. That's why Luke says in the very next verse in his account. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They'd been doing this year after year and century after century. And we're told they went and they found it as he had told them they prepared the Passover there. Just as God's people had celebrated it for centuries. And yet this particular day, this particular year, was going to be different. Very different. Because at this Passover feast, Jesus said something that the world had never heard before. Listen to Luke's account. In verses 19 and 20. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. He doesn't say this symbolizes my body. This stands for my body. He says, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Again, this emphasis on blood. The shed blood of a lamb. The shed blood of the lamb, John tells us, right? At the very beginning of his ministry, behold, the lamb of God, who what? You know it. Takes away the sins of the world. And here comes this time. When Jesus' blood is about to be shed. And so we find ourselves this evening as God's people watching on this special night as Luke, the doctor, huh? remember that's who he is, is going to point out what happened. Because a few hours after eating this Passover meal, the disciples go with Jesus up to the Mount of Olives, right? To the garden known as Gethsemane. You heard it referenced in the, in the bell choir piece. And there Jesus prayed to God, his father. And as he was praying, he was in such agony that Luke, the doctor, the physician, tells us he was sweating Drops of blood. Oh. He's the only evangelist who tells us that. The only one who understands because that's a medical condition. That we now know can indeed happen to someone who is under grave distress. A great deal of personal stress. That wasn't the end, was it? with this blood. Because after the men came to arrest Jesus, they began to mock him and beat him until his back was bloody.
And when they dragged Jesus before Herod, that thorny crown was pushed down onto his head as blood dripped across his face. When the trial was over, they laid the cross on his bloody back. It was torn and bleeding from what appears to be a second beating, a much more severe one, because two different words are used. We talked about that in Bible class this last week. And finally, we're told nails that are driven through his wrist. Blood. Not just a few drops. Blood. Seen. Blood. Betrayed. Blood. Denied. Blood sinned against. It's the blood that we have betrayed and denied and sinned against. Think about the reality of these events. When the disciples saw the blood of their Lord and Savior, surely they thought of it as bad news. It would seem they failed to remember that blood is the sign of the covenant, that first covenant. That's why Jesus uses that language that you heard poured out as a new covenant in my blood. Because in this blood of Jesus, you and I are called to see that forgiveness of sins that he won for us, for them, for all people, all the way back to the garden. Not the garden of Gethsemane, another garden. Because now no longer were people to have to look forward to the forgiveness of their sins that would be secured. Because remember, there's nothing about lamb's blood. You separated from the promise of God and it's just a critter's blood. It's not holy, it's not sanctified, it is in no way particularly noteworthy. Could be any kind of blood. What makes it unique, what we remember this evening, is a promise made by God. Because no longer do people have to look towards a time when the Savior would come. Because in the events that Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Paul testify to, that Savior came. He was right there before their eyes. And now for all times. We've been promised his forgiveness. Through that holy blood. That sanctified blood. That promised and sealed blood. As he invites us again this evening to be a table 
with his disciples. To remember. <clears throat> Sometimes we forget the meaning of that word. It isn't some fond past event. No, it is a word that means and links us to something that is memorable, that is significant, that ties us together. Do this in remembrance of me, my body given for you. That cup poured out is a new covenant in and through his blood. Remember, this is the same one who spoke in the beginning of all time. Isn't that what John says? And in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and what? And the word was God. This is that one. As he said, let there be. And there was. And there was. And now, this new covenant. And it is. This same one who did such great things. His words are spoken to us tonight again. As he says to us in a few moments, this is my body. With this bread and this wine, we have the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior. Not as some symbol, but as that mystery that do not ask me to explain. I just know what the words say. Those words that remind us, this is the essence of a promise made by Jesus to the church. That means to each and every one of us. Forgiveness. It comes in no other way than through God's own action. This blood provides the forgiveness we so desperately need. This is His life blood that He gives. That lifeblood that is our eternal lifeblood. Because of his blood, into all eternity, you and I are assured that our sin is washed away, and that we have been made clean, and that we are new. So may the peace of God keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus as you and I view that suffering and death over these next hours and the services that are yet to come. And as we join to receive his own body and blood and bread and wine. A blessing for each of us. A blessing for now and all eternity. Amen. So as God's presence now is there in his words and in his promises as we bring our offering. And then as we bring forward that bread and wine that we will celebrate together.
we have not had the opportunity in some time to, to think back across the ages, to be reminded that this meal that we are about to receive harkens back into the earliest days of the Christian church. Yes, this what Jesus did on this night. It's brand new. But he said, do it in remembrance of me, and the church has continued to do that. And so the words that you will be hearing in the, uh, at this particular point in the service carries all the way back to the time of St. Apollos. It's the oldest intact Eucharistic prayer that the church has. Oh, I ask you to, to bow your heads as you hear these words that remind us again of what it is that you and I will be celebrating, what it is that God is going to use as such a great blessing in our lives this evening. Thanks be to you, O Lord, because in these last days you sent to us your beloved servant, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior and our Redeemer, and the messenger of your will, this one who is your word inseparable from you, through whom you made all things, and with whom you were well pleased, whom you did send from heaven into the womb of the Virgin, and who, having been conceived within her, became flesh and was manifested as your Son, being born of the Holy Spirit and a virgin, who, when he was betrayed to his voluntary sufferings, in order that he might abolish death and break the bonds of the adversary and tread Hades underfoot and give light to the righteous, and establish a memorial and manifest the resurrection, took bread and he gave thanks to you and he said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Likewise also the cup, saying this is my blood which is poured out for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And therefore, having in remembrance his death and his resurrection, we give thanks to you, O Lord, because you have counted us worthy to stand before you and to serve you. Gather into one, we pray, all your holy people who partake hereof. Fill them with your Holy Spirit for the confirmation of their faith in the truth. And grant that we may praise and glorify you through your servant and son, Jesus Christ, through whom all honor and glory belongs to you, Father, and the Son, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. And we join in our Savior's own words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come now, for all is prepared. The Lord awaits us. The meal is set.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast into all eternity. His presence, his power. For each of us, for all, throughout all time until he returns. And those words that, uh, that Luke gave us about when he comes again. And we will join him. And Christians of countless numbers from every age all the way back <coughs> to the very beginning. May we go in his name and carry his presence into our lives. Amen. We turn to the words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, 
and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to all yet unborn that he has done. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <clears throat> 